Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, so this is probably going to be a pretty short video for reasons that I'll explain a little bit uh, towards the end here. But because of that, this is probably going to be a three-part series for chapter 19. So uh, chapter 18, as part of kind of the first part of our cardiovascular unit, was all about the blood. So we kind of reason that we need to understand the features and characteristics and composition of the blood before we can really understand the benefit we get out of having a heart that pumps it all throughout the body. So as such, now that we're moving on to chapter 19, we can devote appropriate attention to the heart itself. So the first thing to do is get a little bit of anatomy out of the way. Obviously, I'm sure you have a pretty good understanding of where the heart is. So we've talked before about how your entire uh, kind of everything from the waist up is split into two major cavities. You have the thoracic cavity, which is everything pretty much above the line of the diaphragm here. And then you have the abdominopelvic cavity, which is pretty much everything below. Okay, so you, I'm sure, are where the heart lies in the thoracic cavity. And it is actually bound on either side by the lungs. So you can see on the left side here and the right side here. And then on the bottom by the diaphragm. The heart itself, along with some of the major arteries and veins coming off of it, uh, are contained within kind of an imaginary space located here in this dotted line called the mediastinum. And then... To understand a little bit about how the heart is actually made up, uh, the heart is encased within a serous membrane, as many of our vital organs are, uh, and this pair of serous membranes is called the pericardium. So if we take a look at kind of the layers of what makes up the heart, we mentioned the pericardium here that you can see in this kind of blue color here. Uh, on the outer side is going to be kind of a fibrous layer of connective tissue just acting as a sheet of protection here called the fibrous pericardium. Uh, the pericardium itself is actually the serous membrane that you can see there. And then what we're really going to care about is what is called the myocardium. The myocardium referring to the vast majority of the heart tissue that is made up of cardiac muscle. We spent a lot of time in chapter 10 talking about the properties and features of cardiac muscle, the fact that when cardiac muscle contracts, it is going to, the idea being, pressurize the blood and pump it all throughout the body. So the endocardium, something we have not mentioned yet, the endocardium is a very thin layer of tissue on the opposite side of the myocardium, op opposite to uh, the pericardium, that is essentially going to act as a separator between the muscle tissue and where the blood is going to be. So this is a kind of a nice figure because this gives you a pretty good uh, idea of what the myocardium looks like with respect to the cavities inside the heart, the chambers of the heart, the ventricles and the atria, where the blood is going to be contained before it gets pumped along to its next destination. So what's nice about this is you can actually see in the bottom here uh, the musculature of both the atria and the ventricles. So what you should probably do at this juncture is picture these muscles contracting and think of the, the image I always like to use in my head is imagine that you have a water balloon. Imagine taking your hand and squeezing that water balloon. So when these muscles contract, it is going to be squeezing the blood much in the same way you squeeze the water that is inside of a balloon. So as we're really going to find out, it's going to be the contraction of these muscles in the atria and the ventricles that serves to increase the pressure on that blood that is contained within so that we can push it along to its next destination. So from atria to ventricles, ventricles out into the various arteries. So I'm sure you are aware from prior education or rather hearing it uh, from some other places, whatever it may be, that the heart has four different chambers. And blood, as it makes its way through the different chambers of the heart, will occupy these chambers at different times. So we have a pair of atria, both left and right, that are on the superior side of the heart, so here and here. And then we have a pair of ventricles, which are on the inferior side. And again, they exist on the right and the left side. 
So the idea here, and we'll talk about these things in more exquisite detail later on, but the basic idea here is that the atria are going to be receiving blood that is returning to the heart from a variety of different veins. The superior and inferior vena cava return deoxygenated blood from the systemic or, uh, from the systemic circuit, so basically all the tissues that have already taken the nutrients and taken the oxygen from the blood, and then the pulmonary excuse me the pulmonary veins are going to be returning oxygen rich blood from the lungs back to the left atrium. Okay, so what we want to kind of get clear here is the difference in what we're going to call circuits. So we have two different circuits here, the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. So any blood that is in your body right now, keeping in mind there are roughly five to six liters of blood in your body at this time, blood in your body is going to basically toggle back and forth between one of two different phases. When blood is in the pulmonary circuit, that means that blood is somewhere in between the right side of the heart and the lungs. So basically, this blood is either on its way to the lungs in order to pick up oxygen, so it's going from deoxygenated to oxygenated, or it is on its way on a return trip back from the lungs where it has picked up oxygen back to the left side of the heart. And then, if it is not in the pulmonary circuit, it is going to be in the systemic circuit. So blood that is in the systemic circuit is somewhere in between the left side of the heart, which is going to pump that oxygen-rich blood away, uh, or it, it's either in between the left side of the heart, like I said, or making its return trip back to the right side of the heart. So it has already delivered its oxygen to needy tissues like the brain and other places in the body, and it's on its way back to the right side of the heart so that it can be pumped in, back into the pulmonary circuit to pick up more oxygen. So we'll cover this stuff here in more detail in chapter 20 when we actually start talking about blood pressure and vasculature, but we want to go ahead and get some very basic terminology out of the way. So any blood that is outside the heart, whether it's in the pulmonary circuit or the systemic circuit, that blood is going to be contained within blood vessels. And blood vessels come in several different varieties. Arteries are a very large type of blood vessel that usually, with one exception, usually are going to be carrying oxygen-rich or oxygenated blood. The one exception is the pulmonary artery, which is, all, which is going to carry oxygen-poor blood. Veins, another large type of artery, is going to usually, with one exception, usually carry oxygen-poor or oxygen-depleted blood from the systemic circuit and back to the heart. The one exception here is the pulmonary vein, which carries oxygen-rich blood from the lungs back to the left atrium. So, we don't really want to define arteries and veins on the basis of the content of the oxygen that they carry because you never want to define something that just naturally has an exception built in. So here's what I recommend you do. Don't think of arteries and veins in terms of the oxygen content of the blood that they're carrying. Think of it in terms of the direction that the blood is going. Ask yourself, the blood that is in this vessel, whether it's an artery or a vein, is that blood making its way to the heart or is it on its way away from the heart? Arteries are always going to carry blood away from the heart and veins are always going to carry blood back to the heart. So in the case of the pulmonary artery, which is that exception to our oxygen arterial kind of rule there, we still think of it as an artery because even though the blood that it's carrying is oxygen poor, it is going away from the heart. It's going from the heart to the lungs. In the case of the pulmonary vein, which again breaks the kind of rule in the fact that it carries oxygen-rich blood, we still think of it as a vein because it is carrying oxygen-rich blood back to the left atrium. So it's making its return trip to the heart. So regardless of the oxygen content, we'll usually be assuming that arteries carry oxygen-rich blood and veins carry oxygen-poor blood. 
If you're dealing with oxygen-rich blood carrying through the arteries, those arteries will simplify down into arterioles, which will then simplify into capillaries, which are the smallest type of blood vessel where nutrient and oxygen exchange is going to occur. And then the capillaries will feed into venules and then back into veins. So basically, if you think as if you think of arteries as carrying blood away from the heart and veins returning blood to the heart, think of the arterioles, capillaries as venules as being kind of everything in between. So this slide right here is going to be where we stop this video. So you're probably wondering why is this video so, sh so short? Why can't we uh, just keep going? Here is why. So from here on out, I am going to assume that you already know how blood circulates throughout the body. What I mean by that is I am going to assume that at any point you always know where blood is going to go next. So we are going to stop here because I want you to take this opportunity to make sure you really drill it into yourself that you know the direction of blood and the circulation and how it works. So to help you with this, I have put together this flow chart here to help you drill yourself on this and make sure that you have this down pat before you go any further in this unit because what we're going to be focusing on is not so much understanding the progression of blood flow. We want to kind of already have that down. We are going to cover concepts with the idea that we already understand this. So we're going to cut this video off here in just a minute and if you don't feel comfortable with this, I recommend you do not progress to part two of this series until you feel pretty comfortable with this. Uh, with that being said, let me go ahead and walk you through how this flowchart works before we cut it off here. So what I have here is I have designed this flowchart to be color coded. So the general idea is that a blue color indicates that blood in this location is going to be oxygen poor. A red color indicates the opposite. It's going to be oxygen rich. So my recommended starting point for this flow chart is right here in the right atrium. So that's not necessarily where you have to start, but that's where I recommend you start. So blood in the right atrium is going to be oxygen poor. Blood on the right side of the heart is generally always going to be oxygen poor, unless you've got some sort of uh, defect in your septum that allows blood to mix between. So we'll assume that that's not the case, right? So blood that is in the right atrium is oxygen poor. So what you want to know is you want to know that blood flows from the right atrium to the right ventricle, then to the pulmonary artery, which as we just discussed on the previous slide, that pulmonary artery will simplify into pulmonary arterioles and then a pulmonary capillary bed. That pulmonary capillary bed in the lungs is going to be where a lot of gas exchange is going to occur. So namely, all the oxygen that we get from the air that we breathe is going to diffuse into the blood. So we pick up oxygen at that point, and that is why we go from blue to red here. We pick up oxygen, so the blood here has now become oxygen rich. Okay, so those pulmonary capillaries, capillaries will then feed into pulmonary venules and then the pulmonary vein, which directs us into the left atrium, still oxygen rich at this point, then the left ventricle, and then out through the aorta, which then will branch off into a number of our major arteries, which are going to uh, service a lot of our different important organs throughout the body, like the brain and other places, of course. Those arteries will, as again we discussed on the previous slide, uh, simplify down into arterioles, which then will simplify into all the various capillary beds that infiltrate into all of our important organs and tissues, like the skin, the liver, the brain, and even the heart itself. So on the tissue capillary box here, I applied kind of a gradient effect here so that you can see we go from red, oxygen rich, to blue, oxygen poor. That's meant to make sure that you understand that this is where gas exchange and nutrient exchange occurs. On the arterial side where it is still red, that blood is oxygen rich, nutrient rich, etc. So the tissues here, the cells of the liver, the cells of the brain, the cells of the heart, etc., 
are going to take the nutrients, take the oxygen. After all, the whole purpose of the blood for the most part is to deliver these things that every cell in your body needs. So that delivery of those things is going to happen in these tissue capillaries. And then the capillaries will of course simplify or uh, branch off into venules, then to veins. All the major veins in the body will branch into the inferior or superior vena cava, depending on whether it's above or below the midline of the heart. And then the vena cava will drain back into the right atrium here. And from there, you can start over with this flow chart. So we are going to cut things off here. You really, I recommend, should probably make sure that you spend some time going through this and make sure that you have this directionality down pat. For those of you who already do, that's great. You can go ahead and progress on to part two of this video series whenever that video uh, gets released. But if you don't feel 100% confident about this, definitely spend some time with this because you definitely want to make sure that you have a good grasp on this before we progress into some of the more complicated topics here. Okay, so with that being said, I will go ahead and sign off here and I will see you next time for part two.